Don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe and do consider supporting the channel via PayPal or Patreon. You'll find the links in the video description. There's been a lot of talk about the blunders made by Yan Nippon Nishi in the recent World Championship match. Uh, many people were expressing their disappointment with the level of his play. I'm sure that Nepo too was rather disappointed. Uh, but over the next few videos, what I want to do is show you that this kind of pressure and these blunders are just a part of the game and indeed very much a part of World Championship matches. And I think probably especially so when the players are playing at the very top under close scrutiny. Um, I'm going to take you on an historical journey through the blunders uh, f going from Steinitz right through to Magnus Carlsen. Um, I'm going to start with the steinitz Jigorin match, Havana 9 1892. I almost said 1992. Havana 1892. And what we're going to see was described by Gary Kasparov in his book, My Great Predecessors, as the blunder of the century. The 19th century, that is. It occurred in game 23, but actually I want to start just very briefly with game 10. So if you look through these games, actually, it was an extraordinary match. There were so many ups and downs, absolutely fascinating games, and, and it, it was incredibly close. White to play in this position, Steinitz playing white. How would you play here? Just before I show you what actually happened in this game. If you had white, what would you do? You can always pause the video if you want to have a think. Steinitz played g5, which looks very logical to open up black's king. Um, but after knight e7, he, he lost his queen. The queen is trapped. There you go. Uh, it's interesting, this happened on move 30. The time control in this match was 30 moves in two hours. I bet that was a time pressure blunder, but that's a pretty bad mistake. You compare that with Nepos. Um, in fact, instead of g5, d4 is a very cool move so that the queen can come back. And, and actually, after pawn takes pawn, then g5 and white is doing very well in that position. Anyway, that's not the blunder I wanted to show you. Um, this is the real howler. So Mikhail Chigorin with white, Wilhelm Steinitz black. This was the 23rd game. Steinitz led by nine wins to eight wins, and they'd had five draws. So just one point in it. Chigorin was in a must-win situation. If he won, then the match will be extended to the first to 12 wins. Um, so he had to level the scores, basically. It's interesting that, you know, in the recent World Championship match um, in Dubai, I mean, it's literally no exaggeration to say that millions of people were watching that match. And, and that, I think, created, it just creates more tension, even if you can't see those, those spectators. I think um, it was... It, it, just makes it really really difficult for the players and to to block that out is is tricky and, and uh, clearly Carlson could do that better than Nepo and I thought it was very telling that Nepo apologized for his poor play in one of the press conferences you know he shouldn't be thinking about the audience reaction at all so that was clear at that moment that things were, were getting to him it's interesting, in this game, so Havana 1892, apparently there were over a thousand people at the venue watching this game. Uh, that creates pressure. <laughs> so, that, I, you know, I found that very interesting as well. Anyway, let's see. Uh, Mikhail Chigorin with white in a must-win situation. Now, earlier in this match, in fact, throughout most of the match, uh, the players had done battle in the Evans Gambit. So let's just see that very quickly. So that's the Evan Ga Ga Evans Gambit. That was actually the main battleground in this match. 
but Chigorin clearly decided that that wasn't sharp enough and he went for a king's gambit. Pawn takes pawn from Steinitz. He believed in, in taking material, taking gambits and accepting gambits and hanging on to the pawn and he managed to do that. He played Shalop's variation. This is very interesting and, and actually today this has a pretty good reputation but it is messy. Let's have a look. e5, knight h5. It looks very odd to put the knight at the side of the board but the point is that if black can hang on to that pawn then it blunts any attack on the f file and also it's more difficult for white to bring that bishop into play now that the pawn is securely protected. But I think there are interesting ways to generate play for white and I really like queen e2 actually in this position and to play with knight c3 and d4 and go for a quick queenside castling. That's what I recommended on my King's Gambit DVD slash download. You can download it as well. Um, but Chigorin played bishop b2, which is reasonable, which looks through to the knight. g6 protects the knight. d4, bishop g7, castles kingside. d6, knight c3, castles kingside. Um, in fact, the position is reasonable for white. It's hard to get the advantage for white in this position, but, you know, white could just exchange here. Um, and, for example, put the knight back, try to take this and, and take here. That, that's one option. Or if queen takes, then knight e5. And, well, its chances are probably balanced, basically. But Chigorin played knight e1, and that looks does look a bit funny in this position. Because after pawn takes pawn, basically white's center is collapsing. Yes, it's possible to take that knight, but actually the king isn't really affected here. Not when there's a nice bishop on g7. So already Steinitz, with the black pieces, has reached an end game which is pretty comfortable for black. Got the two bishops. Um, it's possible just to take that pawn, actually, and, and black is, is better. Steinitz played bishop f5, and that gives white a chance. But yeah, knight takes pawn would have been fine. But even here, I mean, black certainly should not be worse. And remember, Steinitz just needed a draw, and that would win him the match. And he's starting to put pressure on this pawn. Knight g5 hits the bishop, bishop g6. Knight d5. So uh, Chigorin trying to fight back, but still looks pretty comfortable for black. Knight takes c7. Bishop takes, bishop takes, rook c8. Bishop comes back. I mean, you can see that basically black's pieces are incredibly active. You know, while White has been trying to recover pawns and hang on to the pawns, he hasn't been able to develop his queen's rook. And you can see all black's pieces look great. Material is even at the moment, but black has great activity. Knight check, king here. The position is, by the way, is about to get much more complicated. I mean, here, I mean, this is quite extraordinary. Um, Attention must be must have been getting to Steinitz. He played h4, just certainly doesn't need to do that. Um, just taking off the bishop and playing rook e5. I mean, this is just better for black. You can switch that rook over to hit the pawn on b2. Um, again, black's pieces look very good. But he played h4. And this was really strange. Um, I suspect that in playing what he did next, he was looking for a quick kill. Um, there was time pressure, apparently, um, but I think he just miscalculated. Knight d4, you don't 
still don't have to do that. I mean, Bishop H5 is still okay for black, but Knight D4, I think, is looking to just kind of resolve the tension in the position. So a peace sacrifice takes Rook C2 check and Rook E2. So the threat is to take here and take the knight. And in combination with the bishop, you know, if, if the knight retreats, then the, the bishop will come into the game. Then this looks absolutely fine for black. But Steinitz had overlooked Chigorin's next move, rook ae1. Rook takes pawn check, king h1. And you can see that the bishop on d6 protects that pawn, crucially. And the point is that if black could take the knight successfully, then black would be absolutely fine, more than fine. Um, unfortunately, that fails to this checkmate. Bishop f8 and bishop h6, checkmate. So in this position, it's not possible to recover the piece. So Steinitz stepped up with the king. And rook e8 again threatens bishop f8. So f5 gives the king a little room. Um, but basically, white is now a piece up and should consolidate. So remember, if Chigorin could win this game with white, he would level the scores and the match would be extended. Uh, but there must have been time pressure. This is move 28. Remember, they've got to get to the time control of move 30 so this is pressure and it it is a little worrying for white that now this rook has been sent up the other end of the board um, and yeah split rooks you never know things can happen in such circumstances Steinitz uh, excuse me Chigorin checked on e6 with the knight here clearest move is, is rook e7 actually um, with ideas like this, king f6, knight e4, checkmate. Perhaps easy to overlook that move if you're playing very quickly. It's a, it's a lovely checkmate, actually. And if king h6, bishop f4, well, this is looking very unpleasant for black. Knight f6 threatened. But knight e6 check was played. It still doesn't actually spoil anything. But it's just a little bit awkward having the pieces like this. Rook e2. I mean, here they've actually passed the time control. So, and, and it looks like white is holding everything together. But perhaps you'd like to have a think. How would you play if you had the white pieces in this position? You're in a must-win situation with white. What would you play here? But they have passed the time control, so Chigorin had time to think this one through. Well, the best move is actually rook takes b7. Now, this isn't just about chomping a pawn. The point is this, that if bishop h5, threatening bishop f3, because if that's taken, then there's a back rank mate, then the rook can slip back to cover that square and actually white is safe. White has an extra piece and should win. But instead of that, Chigorin made an extraordinary blunder. Bishop b4 attacking a rook. I mean, who knows? Maybe he was still playing quick moves. Maybe he didn't realize he'd reached the time control. Anyway. Unfortunately, bishop b4 allows rook takes h2. And here, Chigorin resigned because Steinitz would deliver checkmate, the classic two rooks on the seventh checkmate. So with that, Steinitz won the match by 10 gain, 10 wins to 8 with 5 draws. Incredible, only 5 draws in 23 games. So there you go. Blunders do take place in World Championship matches. And as we're going to see, not just with the old guys, but actually coming right up to the present day as well.
Thanks very much for watching.